All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Again, my favorite day today, that is that we have our heart to heart. We have our one on one. We have our open forum. So welcome and let us start. I uh, continue to admire you, <clears throat> the cool beans, that as we, we keep going deeper and deeper into the understanding of the COVID-19 and mechanisms and the drugs and the side effects and the after effects of the, the COVID-19 itself, the questions that I receive are becoming more and more complex, more and more um, interesting, and more and more um, uh, provoking or medical oriented. So that I am very proud of. I'm very proud of you that you have stayed along with me and we have reached this far that there are such beautiful questions. I was actually thinking that I should now take the previous open forum videos and make smaller segments of one or two minutes video per one question and separately uh, upload them on uh, uh, YouTube as well, because these are all very interesting questions and hopefully it becomes easier to go over them. <clears throat> so welcome everyone. Uh, let us start our discussion. There is a lot to be discussed today. There is so much. So let's start. And please, if at any point you feel that the time is more and you are bored, we can stop, but let's start. So a uh, question here, Nina Kant says, question, are there any vitamins that you would not recommend during COVID-19? So the answer is no. Uh, vitamins should be taken during or otherwise and a uh, simple answer, one more part of the answer is if you your, your food, if you're eating healthy, then you may, may not need vitamins. <clears throat> but it is important to keep your vitamin levels balanced nowadays. Then there is an example by Nina says amino acids, could they actually work against you since COVID virus also has a lot of amino acids? So amino acids make proteins and we need proteins to be formed and to be broken down into our system all the time. Most of our cells and the functions that they perform, they need proteins. Most of the enzymes are protein. Most of the microtubular systems are protein. Most of the secretions by the cells are proteins. So of course we need amino acids all the time. And so do not hold back on your nutrition. So generally, no, uh, do not hold back on the nutrition. And this would, don't try to starve the virus by not having the nutrition because our body is going to starve first. Our cells are going to starve first before the virus and we are the ones to lose. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Bowles says, question, can the virus transmit through our sweat glands? So very interesting question. There is a similar question up ahead as well. And that is about the sexual intercourse and the virus transmission. So I'm going <coughs> to, my apologies, I'm going to try to answer both of those here. Or maybe we'll wait for that. Can the virus transmit through our sweat glands? I know many know now the experts are worried it could transmit through fecal matter. Also in the early days, we were even worried about the air recirculation of an air conditioning system. So uh, Lisa, uh, I do not know if you are new to Dr. Bean. We have been talking about the fecal matter uh, transmission or orofecal route of transmission for a long time. And the reason for that is that orofecal transmission by coronavirus, of coronaviruses has been discussed in the books since uh, 2012 and 2016 and even before that. It's a known route. And the reason for that is that the uh, orofecal route, normally what happens is if I draw a stomach here, so let's say this is a stomach, usually what happens is that the enveloped viruses, the viruses that have an envelope around them, sort of a membrane around them, when we put envelope viruses in the acidic environment of the stomach, stomach will break down their envelope and the virus dies. However, in case of COVID-19, COVID-19 has a very thick fur on it, just like, a, like an animal has fur. It has a lots of glycoproteins on its surface, just like fur. 
and that thick layer lipid layer slippery layer of lipid jelly its glycoproteins that protects it protects this virus when it is in the stomach and that protects it from the stomach acids because of that coronaviruses can cause gastritis and then cause the gastrointestinal infections as well that means for the remaining intestinal tract they can cause infections there as well this is why some of the patients have at least 5% of the patients have git symptoms because of coronavirus and this is why the coronaviruses are transmitted or or excreted in the fecal material as well and it is known that coronavirus can be transmitted in the fecal material or excreted in the fecal material for up to 50 days after the symptoms have subsided so fecal oral route is a known thing so back here to lisa's question first question sweat glands no there is no known mechanism that coronavirus can enter the sweat glands and then be then appear in the sweat so normally what happens is <clears throat> so let's say this is a sweat gland what happens is there are uh, so let's say this is the skin surface and the sweat is coming out like this the sweat cells the glandular cells usually make the sweat by so these are i'm trying to make sort of triangular cells here so what happens is this is a cell and the cell will make some sweat in it and that sweat particle or piece of sweat will come out to the surface and will be with a tiny part of the cell sometimes breaks down and then the sweat is secreted out and in the other cases there are cftr channels as well that release sodium separately and chloride separately and then water is uh, accumulated in here now it is not seen so far that coronavirus can actually come into these cells infect them and then be able to come out through the uh, sweat channels or break down the cells and come out in the gland and then be appear in the sweat maybe if we artificially infect a sweat gland then maybe it can do it but sweat is not not known to have coronaviruses in it so no worries about the sweat uh, fecal oral matter yes and then recirculation of an air conditioning system yes we knew that as well that uh, the aerosol can actually be uh, recirculated through the any circulating system continuing on next question mardik bidanian some statins and hypertension drugs are ace inhibitors do you think some of these drugs may influence the susceptibility of a patient getting infected as the ace2 receptor is the point of entry of the sars-cov-2 virus into the cells so we have talked about this many many times so the cool beans here can you answer that question so we have talked about it i would have <clears throat> so this is actually for the sweat i have this uh, Mayo Clinic site here, and they have also talked about sweat somewhere over here. Anyways, and I have all these links in there. This is also about sweat. So where here they say, should I stop going to gym? As the new coronavirus is spreading, be cautious about all possible exposures, including the gym or fitness center. The virus isn't spread through perspiration or sweat, but it's. but items touched by many people barbells etc could pose a risk so we know about that then this is a study that i had actually discussed in detail so if i go back here to this main question i was answering martig bitanians a uh, question that some statins and hypertension drugs are ace inhibitors do you think some of these drugs may influence the susceptibility of a patient getting the infection so the answer is that there is for a very long time this had been a curiosity that are the ace inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers helping to block the receptor and by that mechanism reducing the covid 19's uh, connectivity 
to the cells and so reducing the risk of infection. And there were two school of thoughts. One school of thought said, yes, when you give angiotensin receptor blocker, the receptor will be blocked. Coronavirus cannot attach to that receptor, the risk of infection or the, the speed of infection would reduce. The other school of thought said that no, when you bind the angiotensin receptor blockers on the angiotensin receptors, that would cause the receptors to be upregulated. That means the cell would produce more receptors to compensate for the blocked receptors. And now we have more receptors to bind with coronavirus. The American um, Heart Association came out and they said, we are not sure that any one of that works. And I have talked about it in the past. So they said, if you are using ARBs and ASIs, continue to use it. If you're not using it, do not start it for coronavirus and everything is fine. This is the study that came out and that showed for the first time that the patients that are using on routine, um, uh, their pres as a routine prescription, <clears throat> if they are using ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers, they have less infection. So if you, you if you read here, and I've talked about this before, that is why it is highlighted. ACE inhibitors were associated with a significantly reduced risk of COVID-19 disease, and but no increased risk of ICU care. So what they're saying is that because the receptors are blocked and the angiotensin, if it is an ACE inhibitor, that means angiotensin levels are low. That means inflammation is low. Then the intensity of um, the uh, disease, uh, COVID-19, is less. On the other hand, they said that if you have been using ARBs or ACE inhibitors and you have become sick, then the intensity of the, uh, if you have become ICU um, patient or the intensity has gone up to that level, then once hospitalization is there, once you are hospitalized, then the ICU outcomes are not different from other patients. So in the big early stages, they are helpful. So the, the short answer is to your question, um, yes, at least this study shows that ACE inhibitors and ARBs help reduce the risk of COVID-19. And this was a... <laughs> This was a case that this was a question that had been out there for a very long time. <clears throat> Willow Desk says, I was wondering if you got a chance to look at the studies I mentioned last week about HCQ. Also, there has been some data showing COVID spreading from fecal aerosol. What are your thoughts and any tips for people living in large buildings? So very good question. The very first part of that, Willow Desk, I have been looking at HCQ studies. I would share some of those as well next week. For the second part, the fecal aerosol. So here, is a couple of articles. So this one here, probable evidence of fecal aerosol transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in a high rise building. And then here is another um, study, put a lid on it. Are fecal bioaerosols a route of transmission for SARS-CoV-2? So let me very quickly explain this. What, what they're talking about is the following. When we use the toilet, let's see if I can draw a toilet. <clears throat> so when we use a toilet, what happens is when we flush it, when we flush it, the if the lid is not on it, so let's say the lid is here. If the lid is not on it and we flush the toilet, there are microscopic droplets that are formed, which are then projected in the air. And that is the aerosol. And because COVID patients have fecal transmission, even if they do not have GIT symptoms, then that means that the toilets will have the fecal aerosol material that would come out and that can spread. So in these two studies, 
in this study, what they had done was they looked at the surfaces near the washrooms and they measured the air after creating a simulation of the fecal aerosol in the washrooms of large buildings. And then they measured the air contamination in other parts of the building and they found that the fecal material was the microscopic droplets were found on the surfaces. So that means if we use a toilet and then we do not cover it and then we flush it, then the fecal aerosol matter will actually come out in the air. It would circulate with the ventilation. It would stick to the surfaces around. And when some people would touch those areas, they can become infected as well. So fecal aerosol transmission is a possibility. Now the question is, how do we prevent that? The most important part is to put a lid on it, as the study said. But the problem is that you may have seen some public toilets. They actually do not have a lid. You just flush them and there is no lid there. So if that is the case, we cannot do much. Or maybe there are those papers that you can put on here. Otherwise, if you are in a place where the toilet can have a lid on it, then before flushing, put the lid on. So that is this. This study here, it is a small study. But here, what they saw was they had nine infected patients in a large, tall building with 193 other residents. And then they measured that fecal aerosol transmission was happening. Yeah, so very, very good question, Ray Walker, uh, that eventually you're going to end up touching the lid as well. So uh, when uh, I have been avoiding the public toilets, plus I do not live in a public building as well, so others are not using it near me. But yeah, it is correct that when you are going to put the lid on it, then the lid itself is going to become contaminated by all that material. And as you touch it to lift it and touch it to put it down, you are going to contaminate your hands. So either use a tissue paper or wash your hand like crazy afterwards. But yes, that is still a risk. So very good point, uh, Ray. All right. So I hope that that answers your question, uh, Willard. Has. Very good question. So what are your thoughts on any tips for the people living in large buildings? Same thing, wash your hands a lot, keep, keep your surfaces clean. The vents are going to, vent, to circulate the fecal material as well. So you can't do much about that. Um, and then please put the lid on the toilet seats. Tell everyone to do that. Use uh, gloves or use uh, tissue paper to lift the lid and put it back. Uh, Jay Kirby. <clears throat> Oxford used a simple hematoxylene and eosine stain instead of eosine, eosinophilic specific MBP protein stain um, of the lung tissue section when examining vaccinated monkeys. So after viral expo exposure. Without performing better immunohistological analysis, how can they say the vaccine does not cause any immunopathology? So very good question. It is a little more technical. What, what uh, Jay is saying is, that when the lung tissue of the, the monkeys was examined, a very simplistic way of um, dyeing or staining it and looking at it under the microscope was used. There was no rigorous analysis by more types of stains applied as well. So we do not really know if there were more um, infection, uh, there was some damage going on. So Ray, your, your, Jay, your question is good. I think that there are two things that had to be come to that had to come together. One was the clinical symptoms, and the second was the tissue analysis. <clears throat> if the clinical symptoms said that there was no low respiratory infection, and the animal stayed healthy, and the tissue analysis also showed a simplistic, even with a simplistic stain, if it showed that it is fine, then I think that is okay. Yes, if the clinical symptoms were bad then probably a more rigorous analysis would have been needed. Gajanan Kulkarni says, somewhere I read about apple cider vinegar has effect on renin. And in one of your video, I saw you talking about renin. 
So will apple cider vinegar has any effect, good or adverse on COVID-19? I have a habit of taking ACV for my digestion problems. So very good question. And I have a couple of studies here. One is here. This is an article, a new miracle in medicine, apple cider vinegar. And what they talk about is acetic acid is the main component of the apple cider vinegar. It lowers your blood pressure by reducing your body's renin enzyme production. So if uh, again, the, the problem with the food and supplements, supplements which are prepackaged are fine, <clears throat> especially with the food is to understand the dosage. So let's say if you're going to use angiotensin receptor blocker versus you're going to use apple cider vinegar. For the angiotensin receptor blocker drug, the company is responsible to figure out what is the right dose and what is the effective dose and what is the threshold dose and what is the dosage window of or therapeutic window of the dose and where does it become harmful and what can it do for which age group and other things. With the food, it is actually the that is a problem that we don't know yet what food would contain how much of some something that may be useful or not. So the <clears throat> excuse me. So the discussion here, this is correct that apple cider vinegar would cause reduction in renin production. And we know this that the body produces. So we know uh, renin is produced. Then the um, renin is converted. Renin converts angiotensin 1 or angiotensinogen, angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. We know then angiotensin 2 can be converted to angiotensin 1 to 7 and so on. So yes, if renin production is reduced, renin is produced by kidneys, angiotensinogen is produced by liver. If renin production is reduced, then blood pressure will be reduced. So that is correct. Uh, and that can help with COVID-19 as well, because renin, re less renin production will mean less angiotensin 2, which will, will mean less inflammation. There is a study as well here. So very good questions. I love these questions. They are uh, so deep. There's a study here, antihypertensive effects of acetic acid and vinegar vinegar on spontaneously hypertensive rats. So they have done it, done this study on, on rats, and they have seen that if apple cider vinegar is given to them, then their hypertension reduces. So yes, it is useful, but I cannot tell you what is the right therapeutic dose. Can it, can it help with COVID-19? Yes, but again, what quantity? And what is the effective dose is not known. Very good question. <clears throat> K-pop super strong. <laughs> I love this name. Why do the medical experts always prefer to have randomized placebo controlled trials on medicine for COVID? Can they just use the open label studies and compare it to another study with other drug standard of care as placebo? on which one had the lower mortality on patients? Very, very good question. So what you're saying is the following. Normally what happens is we take two groups of people, we give one group some medicine and another group placebo, mostly cow milk um, or sugar pills. And neither the double blind mean neither the physician who is administering or the uh, hospital staff who is administering the drugs, they don't know who is receiving what. And similarly, patients do not know either that they are receiving what. And in case of COVID-19, that is a dilemma. <clears throat> Let's say you know that hydroxychloroquine is going to work, or lironlimab is going to work, or favipiravir, or remdesivir, whatever, some drug you know will work. Now. COVID-19 is so dangerous that if you try to give placebo to, to a group, they might end up having severe disease and people might start dying there. And if that, that drug works, then people might actually benefit from it. So you are correct that why are the people, the medical community is still insisting on 
double blind, randomized, placebo controlled study instead of give standard care here. So what we know and give the medicine, the new medicine to this group. And I think most of the studies nowadays are doing that. So if you see many of the studies, you would see they would say uh, this new drug given to patients versus standard care that was already been given. And so very good question. And um, um, I think that is the right way. The other issue with the um, nowadays with COVID-19 is and mostly with other vaccinations as well. We cannot once you administer drugs or vaccine, for example, you cannot then challenge the human being to say, now I'm going to give you COVID-19 to make you sick and, or try to make you sick and see what happens. So so good question. Tom Poole, if you have if you had no medicine, how would a doctor treat COVID to give patients best chance? So <clears throat> difficult question for me, Tom. Um, basic idea that I have been discussing with Cool Beans here is that, first of all, hygiene, mask, social distancing, protecting ourselves, so habits. And then second part is supplements and nutrition and food. So without medicine, at least supplements and food should be good or correct. <clears throat> and I have done a video called a food plate for a healthy or a strong immune system. So please, please watch that. I have listed out various foods that offer various supplements that may be useful. So barring that, asking a doctor to treat COVID patient without medicine can become very dangerous. So once again, 81% of the people are going to recover by themselves. They would not even need a doctor. They will be okay. But for the 19% of the people, there would need to be some help. And that help can be very rigorous. So um, I would say good habits, good lifestyle with better um, uh, nutrition and supplements, and then if needed, medicine as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Rob from Florida has two questions here. I'm going to read this part first. This, so what you're saying is last night you differentiated between infection rate and confirmed infection rate. What do you think of the multiplier is 2x, 5x for each person testing positive? How many really have been infected? And then he goes on and says that this leads to my question about kids in school. If real number of kids who get sick from virus is not 0.5, but far less, and those who get die is closer to 1 by 50,000, if we can protect the vulnerable, give prophylaxis to protect, can't we reduce the risk of safety, safely go to school? Yes. So um, <clears throat> for Rob, <laughs> once again, what I had to do was I had to go back to Sweden. The reason I keep using Sweden is that many of their practices have been consistent. So what I did was the following. So look here. <clears throat> First, I looked at Delhi. What I was interested in uh, understanding for Rob's question was, what is the true infection rate? Or how many people are really infected? And so far, there is no formula. So far, there is no way to tell. The different bit difference between case fatality rate and infection fatality rate is case fatality rate means number of people or the rate of people dying out of the confirmed cases. And confirmed cases depend upon how much testing is done. If you're doing less testing, then you have less confirmed cases. And if you have more testing, then you have more confirmed cases. The infection fatality rate means that we know exactly how many people in a population are confirmed, are, have the infection. And then out of them, how many have died? And for COVID-19, we cannot actually really measure the infection fatality rate other than projections. So what I did was I looked at two things. One, I looked at Delhi. The, the reason I went to Delhi was to look at the area that may be more populated. 
to see what is infection rate in a densely populated area. And there could be other con uh, countries or cities as well. So uh, nothing positive or negative here for Delhi. I just wanted to see that. And so what I saw was in Delhi, they're saying, so check this out. The congested areas in Delhi have the highest number of people infected by the novel, novel coronavirus. In central Delhi, where the number of COVID-19 positive cases is the highest, infection rate is 27.9%, while southwest Delhi is 12.9%, and then they have other percentages in other areas as well, if you read here. So the um, one... One result over here is that it is possible that 20, 30 percent of the people are infected. <clears throat> that is one. Now, if we go here to this one, this is the how did Sweden flatten its curve without a lockdown? And there are so many uh, articles about Sweden. And they said that there are two primary things. And if you look at my uh, videos about Sweden, there are so many comments that some people say, hey, we don't wear a mask. Others say that. Uh, we have the social distancing. I sometimes say that uh, Swedes naturally have some distance. They keep some distance. Then some comments come in and they say, well, how dare you say that we are less social? We are very social. This is just a taboo. And so at the end of the day, Sweden has some protocols. They probably do not wear masks. So I have a, I have a link here. I actually have this Sweden live cam here as well. And I have a link here. This link says, so if you see here, why we aren't wearing masks in Sweden. So, <coughs> excuse me. So Sweden is not wearing masks or some people are wearing masks and some are not. Number one. Number two, Sweden has some social uh, distancing um, procedures as well. They have uh, 16 years and younger patients are going to schools. Uh, 50 or more are not, you know, gathering together. Then people are uh, protecting themselves as well. So with all of that, what I wanted to see was how did Sweden end up in a state where their, look at this, their, this is their, sorry, this is, I was trying to make it bigger. So if you see here, this is their number of cases. And their number of cases have gone down. Somebody had sent me a comment saying that, hey, they seem to have been having a spike nowadays. No, I, <coughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm coughing. No, I think that they are, the number of cases are going down, number one. Number two, if you see here, the death rate is really down. So, for example, one death yesterday and then one death before and two deaths before that and so on. So the death rate is down. Death rate down is a more accurate thing to measure compared to the cases that are more or less. Number of cases can be increased or reduced because of the uh, testing. But the death rate, hopefully, is coming out as an accurate number. Now, looking at this death rate, can I say, can I assume that Sweden has reached a point of R0 of 1 or less, meaning they are probably not spreading anymore or not spreading faster. Their spread has reduced. So what I did was I did this little analysis. And let's look at it together. And this is especially for Rob. I'm trying to answer this question that for children, what is the infection rate? Where is the safety level? <clears throat> so look at Sweden for a second. 10.23 million population. From a statistical formulas point of view, herd immunity will have achieved, reached if 66% of the population had become infected and recovered or vaccinated. So that would mean about 6.7 million people. But if you look at it, the total confirmed cases that they have, so this is confirmed cases, this is not infection rate, or this is not the total infection because we cannot count that. 
So the confirmed cases are 84,985. However, when they did antibi antibody test in the society, they came out and they said, well, we have reached 10%. And I know that when this was this news came out, I think last month, there was a lot of uh, news cycle about Sweden that they were saying that we would reach herd immunity, but this is only at 10% and they are really in a bad shape. So look, I am not a fan of the, the lives lost during this process in Sweden, but I don't think that 10% should be looked at to say they have not reached herd immunity and hear me out here. Sweden has zero to 24 years old folks that are 2.8 million. 25 to 54, again in the young group that get less symptoms, 4 million. Remaining are in the older group uh, age. Now check this out. We know that antibodies are 10%. What we do not know is that innate cells also help children to stay safe. Correct? That is why the children don't have um, severe symptoms because their innate arms, especially natural killer cells, take care of the infection much easier. <clears throat> so if we take innate cells, and this is a study out there that about 54% of the children do not develop more than mild symptoms because of the innate arm. So what I did was I took 50% of the young here, and that gives us about 1.4 million people. 10% from the antibodies, so about 1 million people are already infected and recovered. Another 50% of the children may have in become infected and recovered. We do not know, but I'm, I'm just doing a back of the napkin math to understand why Sweden's R0 is reducing and then map it to any other society where children are going to go to school. So 50%, that is 1.4 million. Cytotoxic T cell. And there is no, no, not much tests to be done, but we know that there is immunity given by cytotoxic T cells as well. And it, interestingly, <clears throat> People who have immunity because of the cytotoxic T cells or the T helper one pathway, they usually develop less symptoms. So they are either not aware or even if they are aware, these are less bothersome symptoms. They stay at home. They do not go to hospitals. They do not get themselves tested that much. So I put that to 20%. This is my speculation. I may be wrong. This may be 2%. This may be 0%. This may be more than 20%. I don't know. And uh, with 20%, the number is 2 million more. And other factors. Other factors are staying away from each other, um, older people staying at home, um, not traveling a lot, not going out a lot, wearing a mask, maybe not wearing a mask, staying hygienic. And all those factors also help reduce the spread. So let's say that also contributes to about 10%. It's not the immunity, but it is still helping the virus stay away. So let's say 10% is that. Then cross-reactivity and human coronaviruses. So people who are getting sick with the cold or flu or other human coronaviruses, that they would have some immunity developed as well. And we have looked at those studies. So that is 5%. So if you look at it, the society, possibly in Sweden, has reached about 5 million people recovered or exposed and have become um, protected. If that is the case, further deaths are, this, this is why the deaths are not increasing. And why do I stand behind these kind of numbers? The results are showing it. The death rate that has gone down to one or two deaths per day, that shows that there is something that is achieved in Sweden. Either they have drastically changed their lifestyle or they, they are reaching herd immunity. Now with this, look at this data for children. There are a total of 4,500 4, children who became sick. And the death, deaths are, some papers say zero deaths. Some papers say 16 deaths. So what I did was I took 10 deaths, which are shown here. So if you see here uh, in Statistia, number of coronavirus deaths in Sweden. 
So nine years and younger, one, 20 to 29, 10. <clears throat> Ideally, I would love to have something lesser than 19. I did not find it. So I used the number 10. And this number may be wrong if this, uh, let's say this is 16, or this is 5, or this is 0. I don't know. So I took the number 10. If the number is 10 out of 4,500, then the lesser than 19, the cases are 0.04% of the population. So Rob, that is the first number to keep in mind, that 0.04% of the, of the children, of the population, the children could become sick, number one. Number two. 0.16% of the children became sick out of all of the children. So Sweden has 2.8 million children. Out of them, when 4,500 became sick, that is 0.16%. So again, depending upon the community type, it would depend how many children are there. And then out of them, 0.1 to 0.2% will become sick. OK, so now. How many are dying? So let's say a total of 10 deaths. So that means that we have, if you see here, out of all the confirmed cases, 0.2% died. And so that means out of 501 child. Out of all the population of children, so that is 2.8 million, 0.0003% died, so a very low rate. Out of all the population of Sweden, 0.0001 died. <clears throat> so now if I go back to your question, Rob, <clears throat> the question is, what do you think is a multiplier? Is it 2x or 5x? So in my opinion, the multiplier, if we look at Sweden's data, it is anywhere from 3 to 5x. So if the antibodies are saying that we have 10% community that has recovered, then possibly it is 40 to 50% community that has become protected. <clears throat> that means the herd immunity is not reached, but R0 has really dropped. And that is how the death rate has reduced. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, continuing on, sorry, this was a long mathematical answer. Sorry. So Tenzo Kant says, do you think people living with HIV undetectable reg regular therapy should be on prophylaxis? Are they at a greater risk of developing severe symptoms? So the basic answer is, and I have a couple of uh, links here as well. This is a link, and I have put this link in the description as well, coronavirus and HIV. And there are some uh, hints that they have over here. <clears throat> So looking at your question, you are saying that the HIV undetectable antiviral therapy going on, uh, T cell uh, number is better than 200 per millimeter. If that is the case, the chances of uh, COVID-19 in such patients are similar as others. And the protections should be similar as others. So if others would do prophylaxis, they should do prophylaxis as well but not because they have HIV, just because this is a regular thing. Yes, anyone who has not been taking antiretroviral um, therapy or who is not, who has a CD4 cell number lesser than 200, they need to be not only taking prophylaxis, they have to be very, very careful because they would get a severe infection. So the answer is, the, the case that you're putting forward, they should take prophylaxis just like others or try to uh, keep themselves protected just like all of us. But there is no further increased risk. But it, it would depend upon if they're taking medicine or not. And secondly, if the, what is the number of CD4 cells? So to, to read more, this is one article. I have the uh, link in there. This is another article. This is, <clears throat> OK, so this is for the next question. Next question is, and this is an interesting one. If COVID-19 messenger RNA vaccine gets expressed in various cells and tissues of vaccines, 
recipient who have previously had a natural infection, isn't it possible that their SARS-CoV-2 specific T-killer cells may get reactivated and damage those tissues and organs? So what do you think? This is a question for the cool beans. Can you answer this one? <clears throat> so the question is, if a person had COVID-19 before, and then we gave them the vaccine as well, will they get a uh, reaction? So the answer is no. This is a very simple thing. Just like if you have COVID-19 and you had the COVID-19 again, if you recovered once, then the next time when it is when you're exposed to it, it doesn't matter. Your immune system is going to take care of it. Similarly, if you had COVID-19 and you have antibodies and then you give the vaccine as well, nothing would happen. The cells would express the COVID-19 antigen. The immune cells would come. They would connect with that. They'll say, yeah, we know this one. And they will just take care of those cells and done. So plus immune cells would not need any new learning as well. They would already know how to make antibodies. And the cytotoxic T cells would know how to become active. So nothing. They'll come in. They'll check it. They'll say, yeah, sure. We know this antigen before. So no worries. Tenzo Kang has a, uh, Kanch has a question. Could you share your treatment protocol with us? I think I can do a lecture separately with my protocol. Zaid Rad says, question one, Dr. Bean, regarding ACQ, we know it has an immune modulation effect. Can this mechanism be added to the anti-SARS-CoV-2 mechanism? So yes, we, we use hydroxychloroquine in uh, autoimmune diseases as well. So we know that it modulates immune system. So yes, that is definitely a useful mechanism. Question two is, can you please talk about the role that ginkgo biloba plays as anticoagulant? <clears throat> it is beneficial in patients with COVID-19. So I know that it is a Chinese plant or a herb, but I do not know exactly what is the mechanism of action. So um, I would read up. I'll have to read up about this one. Three-ply mask. If one were to kiss another person who recently cleared a SARS-CoV-2 infection, exchanging saliva, so that is a French kiss, I guess. Is there a possibility that shedding, <laughs> otherwise kissing with exchanging saliva from, from a distance might actually not be uh, really a kiss? Is there a possibility that shedding inactive RNA between participants may activate the previously uninfected person's innate immune system and generate a viable immune response? Very, very, very good question. <clears throat> so uh, I think three-ply mask is uh, trying to convince someone who may have already recovered from or recovering from uh, COVID to say that, hey, if we kissed, I might get immune as well. So good one. A nice try. So here is what would happen. The uh, And I have a couple of uh, links here. One of the links is here that how long can you be shedding? So first of all, we should see that. Look, uh, the WHO's guidance has been that we would consider you not contagious <clears throat> when the symptoms have subsided and then two consecutive RT-PCRs come in negative. They come in negative the next day or 10 days later or a month later, whenever, till that time you are contagious. That's what. Here we have uh, Harvard Health, and they are saying that once the symptoms subside without medicines, about 10 to 14 days after, there is a chance that the person might still be shedding. <clears throat> so that means if you come in close proximity to such a person, you might actually get COVID-19. Or if you kiss that person exchanging saliva, you might get COVID-19. Now, the question of immunity, that can that uninfected person now develop immunity because maybe the infection or the virus level in this person who is recovering is lower? And the answer is no. It would not give you immunity. It would give you COVID-19 because that is how we get COVID-19. People can just breathe and a very low viral amount can reach you and you can become infected. Saliva would have a very high le level. So even if a person is recovering, even when their viral load is less, what would happen is one of the two things. One is if the viral load is so less, and don't, <laughs> don't get any ideas here. I cannot 
draw someone who's French kissing. So I'm just going to make uh, droplets here. So let's say <clears throat> this is a person who is sick and his virus, uh, his saliva and his droplets have a lots of virus in it. Then versus that, there is another person who is recovering and maybe the virus load is very less. When this maybe saliva or aerosol or the droplets, they end up in another person's uh, respiratory system. If the load is too less, then our immune system is just going to take care of it right at that area and we would not even know it. And it's not necessary that we would develop immunity. Maybe we would, once we are exposed again with a higher load, we will become uh, infected. If the load is high, then we will become infected. And then it depends how does our immune system respond. It might respond with in an asymptomatic way. It might respond with mild symptoms or severe or so on. So uh, sorry to break the party here. Um, kissing, exchanging saliva would not make you immune. If the person is shedding, they're going to make you sick. And I'm not against kissing or, or, uh, or exchanging saliva. So that, that is totally your call. But I'm just giving you a medical opinion here. Then there is a question about uh, sciwisdom.com. They're talking about Dr. Zelenko's uh, zinc sulfate uh, dosage. And they're saying that he has talked about 220 milligram of zinc sulfate, while the, uh, the bottle says 50 milligram. So Sai Wisdom, I would say that tweet this same question to Dr. Zelenko. And that he's the right person to answer this one, because I usually give zinc <clears throat> own label zinc dose. So whatever I ask people to buy the zinc or Cervex Z, and whatever is on label zinc dose is what I uh, ask them to take. Ellen Stein. If you are allowed to write a question, write questions for a senator to ask Fauci, what would you ask? So I had, of course, trillions of questions to ask Fauci, but I wrote down some over here. So correct. And I I suspect that as well. Jamie, as you said, Zelenko was talking about elemental. So this is why I said, please ask him so that he can clarify. <clears throat> so my questions are Fauci. Why? Are you not focusing on ways to aggressively manage the virus in the early phase? I think we should we should focus there. Why is there no prophylactic protocol adapted so far? Look towards India. They have a prophylactic protocol. Why are we in the US so much behind on prophylaxis? Have you collected data from outpatient doctors? So the problem is we can collect data and we can do studies in hospitals. But that data does not map for uh, initial stages of the infection or for long haulers. So we need to collect data and we should do studies in the initial part and in the long hauling part to see how to manage these patients. So have you collected that data from the doctors to see what are they managing? How are they managing? What are they seeing? Have, you have your organization started working on the long haul management methods? So that is very important. This is becoming a problem. And once again, nobody is caring at this time. We need to figure out how to manage long haul patients. Then one question that I have for everyone, that is how come drugs like remdesivir got approval like this? I still remember on, on a, a day zero, let's say, Remdesivir's announcement came out. And within a few days, it was approved. And it has shown not much efficacious. It is harmful, as Dr. Zelenka was talking about. Efficacy is down the drain. It doesn't really work. And then compare that to hydroxychloroquine, for which there are so many studies. There are so many doctors who I have been managing patients with this drug and successfully. And even then, there is no uh, approval for this drug. Instead, actually, there is a disapproval in some states. The people have been, uh, administrations have been banning this drug. Uh, doctors are scared of uh, writing this, prescribing this drug. Uh, my uh, One of my 
brothers, he called me and he said that I had some joint pains and he got some tests done. And doctor thought that this may be an autoimmune disease. And he said, I usually prescribe HCQ, but I would not. And I was blown away. Why would you not do HCQ? Because he said there is so much focus on who is pre prescribing HCQ. Anyways, I don't agree with that doctor. But HCQ has. So why is this such a problem? One can have criteria for drug administration. Every drug comes with a set of criteria to say, you give this drug to following people in following circumstances and you take care of following things. Say that. Make a protocol in that way. Why are we killing so many Americans? Again, I'm sure that other countries are taking care of them. I am looking at many countries now successfully getting themselves out of this situation. America, we just stuck here. So um, these are a few questions that I have uh, for Fauci. <laughs> And of course, he himself has, I believe, uh, praised hydroxychloroquine somewhere in the past. All right. So Lisa Bowl says, I'd ask him to get. <laughs> All right. So that is a response. Paul Elkins, as more data is compiled, high NLR and lymphopenia are early indicators of progression to severe cases. So this is a very important thing. And this actually deserves a complete lecture. The discussion here by Paul is the following. What he's saying is, so let's look at this. What we are observing, so there is a study. Let me show you the study. Here is the study. This is July 9th. Higher level of neutrophil to lymphocyte is associated with severe COVID-19. What does this mean? So we know that part of our innate arm. So let's say this is the innate arm of the immune system. It has dendritic cells in it. It has macrophages in it, natural killer cells in it, neutrophils in it, monocytes, and so on. So, so these are the cells that constitute the innate arm. Neutrophils, neutrophils are one such cells here in the innate arm. Then we know that innate arm activates the adaptive arm where there is a naive T cell, which is a T helper four type cell. Then that causes T helper two cell to be activated in the presence of interleukin four. And that causes B cell to be activated, correct? And B cells make antibodies. We know that. T helper one can be activated in the presence of interleukin 12. And that causes cytotoxic T cell cytotoxic T cell to become activated, correct? What they're finding is this, this study. What they're finding is that if a patient in the early stages, if a patient has more neutrophils and less CD4 cells and less CD8 cells, if these cells are less, CD4 and CD8, B cell doesn't matter, don't matter. Neutrophils, if they are more, that is called neutroph neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So when neutrophils are more and lymphocytes are less, if that ratio is observed to be abnormal, then the patient has a five times more risk of becoming severe with COVID-19. That, that is a study here. So this is a study in here. They talk about, they looked at various patients and they looked at NLR, NLR, that is neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, was identified as an early risk factor for severe COVID-19 illness. Patients with increased NLR should be admitted to an isolation ward with respiratory monitoring and supportive care. So now if we go back here to the question, Paul is saying as more data is compiled, high NLR and lymphopenia are early indicators of progression of severe cases and mortality. What is your thought on the pathogenesis causing lymphopenia so early in the disease? So it is very interesting that Paul's question is, what is causing it? And I looked into this uh, study as well. And they have a couple of messages here. <clears throat> so one second. Here. So they, they actually say we do not know what is happening. Is it this that the neutrophils are 
made more or is it this that the CD4 and CD8 cells are destroyed more by the virus? So the, the two possible mechanisms they are saying is one of the most convincing explanation is based primarily on the physiological link between neutrophilia, that means increased neutrophils, and lymphopenia, that means reduced lymphocytes, and systemic inflammation and stress. So he's saying that generally when inflammation and stress occurs, this can happen. So that may be one reason. Another reason is that neutrophils are important cellular components of the host defense in the innate arm, whereas lymphocytes are considered as major cells involved in adaptive arm. Lymphocytes play a key role in regulation of inflammatory response and sustained reduction in severe cases is associated with non-resolution of inflammation. So what he's saying is, if somehow this system becomes dysregulated, and we know macrophage activation syndrome, we've, we've talked about that. If, <clears throat> if this system becomes dysregulated, then it is possible that these cells become affected by inflammation and are destroyed either as part of direct viral infection or as the cells are now gone dysregulated in the immune system, they are just killing more cells nearby and the lymphocytes are the victims as well. This is also possible that neutrophils are triggered to be produced more. So whatever is the re reason, this is very important for cool beans for all of us uh, that when NLR or when neutrophils are more, lymphocytes are less, even when the patient is in early stage, it is an indicator for the patient that he would become severe. And so the study says, if you observe this, please take them to a here. <clears throat> um, so look at this. On the basis of our current study, patients with COVID-19 who are suffering from pneumonia and those with increased NLR should be admitted to an isolation ward with respiratory monitoring and supportive care rather than putting them into centralized isolation. So they're saying take care of them. They can become severe. So very good question. And uh, um, I think this deserves a complete lecture as well. So Paul, good questions. Paul says, the bradykinin storm theory explains that hyaluronin is the main source of the extreme hypoxia and severe cases. Has hyaluronin been measured directly from C19 patients to confirm? If so, at what point does hyaluronin start to accumulate? I do not know what is the right uh, pronunciation. I always call it hyaluronin. And is it concomitant with ground glass opacities? So let's look at it very quickly. What he's talking about is this. Paul is saying that we talked about bradykinin storm a few days ago, and we talked about the jelly-like substance that starts accumulating, which is hyaluronin. And that hyaluronin or hyaluronic acid, the secretion increases in the presence of bradykinin. So Paul's question is, have we a direct, do we have a direct measurement of this, number one, in COVID patients? And number two, is it concomitant with ground glass opacities or the x-ray appearance on, on, for the patient, uh, patient's chest? So the answer, the bradykinin storm is... I think I, I, the title I wrote was bradykinin instead of cytokinin storm. I should not have said instead. It is bradykinin and cytokinin, uh, cytokine. We talked about this before as well, that what happens is whenever tissue damages, it would release calicrins. And these are the calicrins will cause kinins to become activated to become bradykinin. So, <laughs> excuse me. So this calicrin and the tissue damage is gonna happen in SARS-CoV-2, especially in the pneumonia. So when that would happen, the congestion that would occur here, the congestion would occur because the, the blood vessels will become more permeable and they will be transudated that would come out or there are fluids and proteins that would come out, cells would come out. So there will be congestion here. Concomitantly, simultaneously, hyaluronic acid would also be released. 
So we can't say that it is only the cytokine, cytokine storm and the hyaluronic acid is not part of it because whenever inflammation would occur and congestion would occur, we will have hyaluronic acid. So this would always be present. It is just that when it occurs in the lungs, it makes the oxygen movement really difficult and carbon dioxide movement difficult through that bad respiratory membrane. So let's see how much more. I think we are almost at the end of this. Uh, <clears throat> Tony says, Lironlimab update. So I'm going to do an update maybe on Monday or Tuesday. So good question, Tony. Then there is uh, Jelin in quarantine. She's saying, or he's saying, could you discuss different theories behind what is happening to CV19 long haulers? Dysautonomia, MCAS, vasculitis, viral persistence. Also, can the pathology of bradykinin theory in CV19 explain the GIT symptoms? Have not seen reference to that. The GIT continues to be debilitating issues of many patients. So very good questions and simple answers. So let's look at that. First of all, the long haulers. I tweeted this out this morning as well, and there were lots of responses. Look, long haulers, one possibility is, for example, I have a friend who is still uh, admitted after five months in the uh, ICU. He went in there 46 years old, was diabetic, got COVID, uh, kept listening to that uh, bullshit message by somebody that you should just drink some hot water and you'll be OK. The end result was he had a severe case, called the ambulance, uh, ended up in the emergency, and now five months is still there. Kidneys became really devastated, heart became devastated, lungs became destroyed, and now as he's recovering, he would probably need to have oxygen forever now. So much of the lung destruction and scarring and fibrosis has occurred. So that is the baby lung physiology that has happened. So that is one that tissue damage, which may be permanent, has occurred. And that is a long hauler. Another possibility is tissue damage that may not be permanent, but would slowly recover. So that may be vascular damage, that may be the muscle damage, that may be lung damage, that may be upper respiratory system damage, that may be heart or other tissues. And it is possible it is recoverable damage, but it might take some time. So that is tissue damage. Then it is possible that macrophage activation syndrome has started and the immune system has become dysregulated. And that dysregulation is now becoming chronic or becoming long hauled. Then this is also possible that the virus is still present. Maybe the immune system and the virus, they are just working on each other in such a way that there is a persistent level of virus just sitting in there. And it is just continuing. There may be other reasons that I do not know. So most of these things I'm speculating. I am sure about the tissue permanent damage. I'm sure about the tissue temporary damage that would become OK. I am not sure exactly how the immune system and virus are interacting in a long haul situation. But these are mechanisms. We've been talking about it, and they are exactly possible. I have seen so far that when I give my patients steroids pulse, they recover. All of my long hauler patients, even last week, and I tweeted about this in my tweets. Um, I had a father and daughter. They both became sick. Father had cancer as well and uh, 62 years of age. He developed such a bad uh, situation that his oxygen level went down to 84%. They took him to hospital. Hospital didn't have place. They came back, called me. We started managing at home. Fortunate for us that they both recovered. Two and a half months later, we I was talking with them on a follow up and they both said the the daughter said that, hey, I still have fatigue and I sometimes develop fever. And father said that my gums hurt and I feel fatigued and my gums hurt that I cannot chew well. 
So I started a um, steroid pulse for both of them. And now I talked with them this morning and both of them, the girl, the, the daughter has become fully recovered. Her symptoms are gone. They were lingering for two months. And father said that my, I can start chewing on both sides now. So the pain has reduced. It is still there. So I'm going to give him one more pulse uh, course for steroids. The point is, now, is that the virus still sitting in there? I don't think so. I think that they have a, a macrophage activating syn syndrome or maybe chronic fatigue syndrome after the virus. Whatever that was, it responded well to steroids. So the point is long haulers. It's a very, very good question. <clears throat> and um, I don't have any studies yet to look at those and say, this is exactly what happens in long haulers. And I think there are going to be multiple categories and we would have to find that out and we'll have to s save folks because they are continuing to be long haulers after months of the recovery. Now, the second question by Jilleen, and that is the GIT symptoms. So um, I talked about GIT early in the talk as well. GIT symptoms are 5% of the patients have them. And the coronavirus can cause gastroenteritis, and that would cause GIT symptoms. The management approach is as the same as the rest. So three ply mask has this that um, look at this vitamin D. I would look at it. Uh, Luke Henry says, "Do you think that medicine should be more advanced than it is now? What do you think will be the next breakthrough in medicine?" I really, I think that we have reached a lot. We have done a lot of advancement. I am very, very much uh, interested in genetic uh, management. So even before a baby is born, if we can look at mother and father's genetic material and decide where the issues may be and try to fix them before, we can take care of many of the things. <clears throat> and second one, I believe that uh, aging is almost going to be reduced or stalled very soon. Um, Tenzo Kench. Few studies discuss the possibility of infection through sexual intercourse. Have you come across any study about the possibility of spread? So um, I have. So one over here, this is not a study, but this is a Mayo Clinic. Sexual intercourse and the uh, spread. So look, in a sexual contact, of course, there are touching each other's surfaces, touching other surfaces nearby, touching skin, kissing, saliva exchange. Uh, then intercourse has uh, semen and the uh, vaginal uh, secretions. Then anal uh, sphincters are nearby as well, and the fecal matter may be present in all of this. And then maybe having sex might cause sweating as well. So in all of this, the areas of transmission are still the same. And that is respiratory system. That means oropharyngeal respiratory system. That means oropharyngeal area is a risk area. So if a person is shedding, then they will be shedding from these areas. But sweating would not do anything. The wounds will not do anything. Injuries will not do anything. Similarly, semen doesn't have the virus. Uh, vaginal secretions do not have the virus. However, because fecal matter contains the virus, that means external anal sphincter will have the virus as well if it is not properly cleaned. And if during the sexual activity, one comes in contact with the fecal route, then it is possible that if, for example, hand is touched, and then that hand goes to your mouth, or there are some sexual um, methods as well where uh, fecal route is also, or the anal canal is also used. In that case, it is possible that one would come in contact with the fecal matter. If that is the case, then the virus can be transmitted. And please remember that orofecal route is possible with coronaviruses, and the uh, fecal material can contain coronaviruses up to two months after the symptoms have resolved. So the intercourse it itself is not uh, going to cause the transmission, but all the activity which then leads to 
nasopharyngeal areas exposure or the uh, the fecal materials exposure or the surfaces that are nearby if they have viruses that can cause the uh, transmission so good question and i have this link here as well uh, franklin ravi says or ravi just want to know the difference between immunity with a vaccine and immunity got due to recovery after COVID-19. If both are the same, why is immunity with vaccine last longer and other is mostly two or more months? So the, the first, uh, the assumption here or the premise here is incorrect that the immunity to COVID-19 lasts for two or more months. We are now seeing that immunity has lasted for four months. There is another study in which they saw that the immunity can last for five months. Previous coronaviruses, we saw that immunity lasts for two to three years. So the both of them should invoke immunity that would be equally uh, of the same duration. So that is two years for vaccine and two years for infection or one year or three years, whatever it is, it's going to be the same. Yes, this is possible that some people's immune system is going to respond differently depending upon any immune pathologies. But I'm talking about healthy individuals. So with this, um, Anthony says, and I, I must ask you, um, we are seven, uh, one hour, 18 minutes. Should I continue or should we stop for today? <clears throat> and I haven't yet looked at the questions in the live stream. So I am at the end of this one and then I'm gonna come to the live stream. If you guys are okay, if you are fine, I can continue. If you feel it is too much, we can stop, whichever way you like. So I'm just very quickly going to look at this one. So this is uh, Z Dog, and uh, hey everybody, Doctor Z. Okay. So Doctor Z uh, is a friend of our one of our medical directors in Doctor Bean. The comment he was making there was that this new. Um, this new message that somehow the deaths are only 6% out of 160,000 deaths in the US, and it is 160K are not really the COVID-19 deaths. And he is commenting, Dr. Z is commenting about that, and then Anthony is asking me to see if it is correct. So yes, Dr. Z is correct in this one. What he's saying is when somebody dies, there is a death certificate issued, and on that certificate, usually there are reasons written and i know this that most of the time eventually the death occurs because heart fails or the brain fails with heart or the respiratory system fails or liver fails but mostly heart or the respiratory system so now heart failure or the respiratory system failure may be because there was a cancer or there was some other disease but last moments are where these two organs usually stop and that is when the person dies. So I think the, the discussion had been that many people, let's say somebody has a comorbidity of uh, being a heart patient. Then they caught COVID-19, they died. Now the death certificate is gonna say that they died of COVID-19 and they were a heart patient. And so now people are trying to spin this and say, well, they were actually a heart patient. That's why they died. And they also just had COVID as well. And so the real numbers are not 160,000. The real number is really 6% of that. And so these 6% are those who, let's say, had no comorbidities, but the death certificate only showed COVID-19 and that's it and nothing else. Everybody else had something else in there as well. But that is a normal practice for medical doctors to put together the primary cause of death and then other um, reasons or other failures, organ failures that are present. So Anthony, uh, Dr. Z is saying correct. And the deaths that are reported are correctly marked as COVID-19. Um, Frank Kushner, for, so this is a hydroxychloroquine. We'll talk about it. Ali says, how would the be the management of COVID in children? So <clears throat> this is Ali, this is an area where uh, I am. Uh, I'm not very much sure. I don't I'm not a pediatrician, so I stay away from this part. This is something that pediatrician should talk about. And final question, Dick Roberts says, have you reviewed the math plus protocol? 
So there is a latest update to Math Plus protocol. I would do a separate review of that just so that it becomes a video of its own. So here we are. So all the Twitter questions are done. Now I'm here. So would, let me look at some of the questions here in the live stream. And if you have still the um, courage to continue going, we can talk about it. <laughs> Chantal, yes. So Luffy, Luffy has changed his time to meow. All right, let's 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 look at the questions here in the um, live stream. <laughs> Guy Teffler says, next porn film might cause a virus to mutate, <laughs> the possible. So uh, Cindy says, what about COVID-19 causing male sterility? Uh, I haven't yet heard Look, the, the sterility, male sterility can occur because, so if I am here, so what would happen is, let's say here are the testes. From the testes, spermatic cord goes, and then let's say this is the prostate. <clears throat> I'm just simplifying. And so these sperms arrive here, and then there are, ends, uh, there are glands in the prostate as well, which make parts of the semen, and then all of that, opens up in urethra. So let's say this is urethra. And then finally, this material is brought out with some more fluids. And this is brought out, correct? So that is the, that is the semen plus the sperms in it. Now, sterility will mean there is some problem either in production of the sperms or in the travel of the sperms or in the production of the fluids that are part of semen to allow the semen to go all the way in the vagina and then reduce the pH, change the pH of vagina and then allow the sperms with the nutrition material to go towards the ovaries. So if any of this area becomes disrupted, that is when the person will become sterile. So now the question is, um, one second, let me hide this. So the question is, can coronavirus impact any of this? Or can coronavirus cause suprarenal gland damage, which then in turn can cause steroid production damage, which would then cause a person to have uh, testicular atrophies and so on and cause damage? I haven't seen any such situation. I haven't seen sperms uh, or testes to be affected or the spermatic cord or the prostate gland or the urethral area. So I think this may not be possible, but I will look at, look at it as well. So good question. So there is a question by Ben. Should I love or leave my windows open all the time? <clears throat> depends upon the climate and temperature and depends who is outside. If there is a crowded street outside and you leave the windows open, then you might actually get the coronavirus coming in. Um, if the weather is too cold, you might get sick. So yes, ventilate often depending upon the situation. So don't leave them open all the time, but ventilate often. There is a question by J James Carl. I just joined. I have been trying to understand if bradykinin weakens blood wind barrier. Does it increase risk of using ivermectin? Don't know if you answered before I got on. So <clears throat> bradykinin is part of inflammatory system. So whenever inflammation occurs, that is the place where bradykinin is present. And that, that is where when bradykinin is present, the blood vessels would dilate, they will become more permeable, the fluids would start oozing out. This applies to blood-brain barrier as well. Blood-brain barrier in the patients of meningitis, for example, um, let me go back here in the patients of meningitis for example what happens is so <clears throat> let's say this is the brain tissue and we have a blood brain barrier around this i'm just going to make a simple blood brain barrier and then blood is out here from the blood vessels things can go in and come out but blood cannot go and touch the brain tissue this blood-brain barrier can become compromised by inflammation, for example. This is what is called meningitis. 
if that happens, there are bigger holes that open up in the meninges, either by damage or by inflammation, and that will be bradykinin. <coughs> Excuse me. So if bradykinin is present here, it can cause a blood-brain barrier to become swollen. Luckily, when bradykinin is present here, so people of COVID-19 are getting, let's say, pneumonia all the time. Luckily, that bradykinin doesn't go to the blood-brain barrier and doesn't cause that to swell up and become inflamed and open up and cause the issues. But in theory, yes, inflammation of meninges will involve bradykinin's presence that would open up the meninges that would allow things like ivermectin to pass. So that in theory is possible. Uh, question, I'm looking at the word questions. So William Day says, I wrote a letter to my doctor in internal medicine requesting to stockpile, not take budesonide and ivermectin. He was uncomfortable prescribing because I don't have asthma. Bottom line, no. Doctors need help at this time. Um, OK, so I'm going to see if there are more questions. I find it difficult to find questions if they are not marked with question. <clears throat> So Bernard O'Connor says, I don't dare say it outright, but my long hauler seems to be well for now. Melatonin was the last thing I added along with vitamin K. All could be coincidence, but it is one data point. Melatonin is actually very useful. Uh, Anthony says, I'm a long hauler. I think the virus wipes out our CD4 and maybe B cells, no antibodies. Uh, look, the B cells and uh, CD4 cells, even if they're wiped out, they will be produced again. There are millions of cells produced every day and millions of cells are dying every day. So that should not be an issue. Uh, HIV is a different case where the virus itself just destroys the lymph lymphocytes. And so even if we make new, it just goes into them and kills them again. Uh, I have not seen this about COVID to do that, but there is a problem. Maybe there is a low level of... Uh, lymphocytes or more neutrophils or macrophages have become uh, disregulated and now are not becoming stable again. Uh, so far, all of the long haulers I have treated, I treated them with steroid delta cotrill and it works. 100% of my long hauler patients have become recovered. And again, that may be a coincidence. It's not a study. It's my anecdote. Uh, question. Raza says, could the lower current CFRs be due to lower viral load as most people are wearing masks? <clears throat> Whereas in March, people getting infected must have had huge viral loads. So there is definitely a behavior of the people as well. That has changed the case fatality rate. Definitely there is a contribution from there. We have now the whole world is looking at it. We are looking at each other. We are learning, we are seeing uh, our loved ones sometimes getting sick or sometimes getting severely sick, and we are protecting ourselves. So this is one of the reasons. That is why if you see the uh, Sweden uh, sheet that I made, I wrote other factors. OK, so there is a question here. Uh, what can we do to demand early treatments by our doctor? This is. Jian, I think that if our medical community can reach this point at this time to start looking at it and start giving them prophylaxis and start treating them aggressively in the beginning, instead of saying, okay, you got mild symptom symptoms, stay home, take Tylenol, you'll be okay. If that is a time where we pay attention, I think we would have very few hospitalizations. Now, your question is difficult. What can we do to demand early treatment? It is a doctor's prerogative to decide what treatment they're going to give you. And because uh, organizations like WHOs and CDCs and FDAs and the National um, Institute of Health uh, Administrations, they have dropped the ball on this to say, how do we manage the early stages? And how do we manage aggressively on the early stages? How do we manage long haulers? 
doctors are not allowed to do these things easily. So that is a problem. So I don't know how to, even when you might have heard Dr. Zelenko yesterday, he said that even he finds it difficult sometimes to give hydroxychloroquine. He cannot do it in all cases. Ray says, can you write prescriptions online? No. <laughs> Sorry, Ray. Um, Jian says, can you treat us online? I'm so sorry. Um, no. JTJ says, <clears throat> at this point, the disease is largely due to incompetence of medical. That is it. JTJ, you're absolutely very correct. Now we understand the virus very well. Just I have done 159 videos on it. I was thinking this morning that just about this virus, I have written a complete book in the form of these lectures. This is how much we know about it. I am just one entity. The, the literature is out there. You are very correct that after so much of the knowledge, the only reason that the virus is still being an evil thing is because of the failure on the uh, management approaches. And I'm, I'm sad about that. <clears throat> So Moose Lodge says, recently the city did a sewage sample test near a university in town and determined that the sewage contained coronavirus. And now they want to test 800 students. Is that a logical sequence? I think it is very interesting. Instead of going to all 800 and say, we want to test you, or instead of going to the whole community and say, we want to test you, they tested the sewage first and confirmed that is there infection there or not? Now that they've seen it, that means there is infection in the hostel or the dorms or the college. In the next step, they are probably going to go and do group testing where you take blood from five people and do one test on them. And if test is positive, then you test all five of them. And if the test is negative, then all five of them are clear. So I think this is just a, a way to test in a mass way. So it is good. So there is a question that, is it true? And please, guys, if you put a question, write a question with it. It makes me, it makes it easier for me to find the questions. Um, Lollipop Animation says, is it true there will be a vaccine by the end of the year? I think so. And uh, there is a lot of politics on that as well. There is a lot of medical concerns about that as well. Rushed vaccine, proper, would it be right or would it not be right, and so on. I am going, here is how I'm going to approach it. I am going to look at the trials data to see how did that pan out. What will be missing in that data for me will be the long um, duration consequence of vaccine. But at least in the short duration, I would know how effective, how safe, and how valuable the vaccine is. <clears throat> so there's a comment here, Michelle. There are resources listed via Zelenko's Twitter offering to mail ACQ upon request. So somebody who needs ACQ, please, uh, you can contact Dr. Zelenko. Um, question. So Kim says, uh, Dr. Sayed, which steroid do you use on your long haulers? I use Delta Cotrel. It's a prednisolone or prednisone. What dosage? So I tweeted that today. Again, this is not a uh, prescription for anyone. Uh, please, do I'm not your doctor. Don't use it. Uh, ask your doctor if you needed the medication. For my patients, I use, um, you can actually use Medrol Pack. That should be fine as well. What I do is I give um, Delta Cotrill 5 milligram morning, lunch, evening for two days, two days. Then Delta Cotrill morning and lunch for next two days. Again, same 5 milligram. And then Delta Cotrill mornings only for two days. And then I stop. And it has been working wonderfully. Um, none of my patients, um, I'm blessed, none of my patients are in the long haul state. I found out about these two patients. I gave them the pulse 
Uh, one of them has fully recovered. Other one is recovering. I'll give them one more pulse, and I'm sure that they will be fine. Moose Lodge says, some cities are testing sewage, so we just talked about it. Uh, Cindy says, can a medrol dose pack? Absolutely. Yes, it can work. And it is actually uh, put together with a tapered dose as well. Nipa Gandhi says, uh, I am a dental surgeon. What is a preventive dosage for ivermectin diet? Thank you. So <clears throat> with the same disclaimer, not for you. Uh, I'm not prescribing it to anyone. I have been using ivermectin for prophylaxis for my patients. Six milligram BD once a day. So six milligram in the morning, six milligram in the evening, done. However, here is a thing to consider. Ivermectin's half-life is 18 hours. That means this therapeutic dose stays with us for about one to two days. That means if you are exposed, for example, you're a dental surgeon or a dentist and you are exposed all the time to the oral cavities and the salivas and the vapors, then you may need to do ivermectin maybe every other day. <coughs> Excuse me. Every other day, six milligram BD or just once a day. So I, I saw some doctors, they're using ivermectin mectin once a day, six milligram, and that's it. So you may have to take it, let's say, every other day, six milligram at least once a day. And I'm seeing some doctors only giving it once a week. So I give it six milligram BD every two or three days uh, if the pe person is at a essential work and they are at a high risk. Otherwise, once a week. Um, OK, so Michelle says, it's not Dr. Zelenko himself. I'm, I'm continuing to put this comment up. So whoever needs the hydroxy, they can read it. It's other RNs that have posted this option on this Twitter feed, uh, on his Twitter feed. You have to really dig to find him, find them. Um, so uh, Debbie says, aren't steroids risky in immune deficient patients? Definitely. This is why my disclaimer that um, <clears throat> ask a doctor, he's, he would have to see what is your need and is it appropriate to prescribe or not. Raza says, is it possible to fight off the virus and produce IgA antibodies instead of IgG antibodies? I'm a long hauler and my serum IgA was above normal. Uh, <clears throat> The, the way our system works, let me just very quickly, and I'll take one more question after this. Um, so let me just very quickly talk about how the IgAs are formed. So look, this is a B cell. When it is not active, it is called a B cell. Let me take the question off. It is called a B cell. When it becomes active, it becomes a plasma cell, correct? And it starts making antibodies. The very first kind of antibodies it makes is IgM. Then it, it does a class switching. And what happens is not the same cell. The cell makes millions of copies which are active. Some of the cells, so there are, let's say, millions of B cells that are making IgMs against the COVID-19. Some of those, let's say 100,000 of them, will switch their class and they'll start making IgG and they'll keep, keep making IgG. Some of these cells will switch their class to go to IgG and then very quickly go to IgE, for example. The, the way to remember is what classes come one after the other, M, D, G, R. M is made and D is made simultaneously, then IgG is made, then E is made, and then A is made. So some of these IgG, out of, let's say, these 100,000 cells, they proliferated and they became a million as well. Then 100,000 from them will start making IgE. And then some of these and some of these and some of these will then further class switch 
and then they will make IgA. Now, the longer a cell is present and working and proliferating, the longer it would continue to class switch, and eventually the final route is IgA. So it is perfectly fine that if after some time, the um, immunoglobulins that you have are mostly IgA, that is fine. You would continue to have IgM. Mostly you would have IgG. IgM would decline. IgG would stay. IgA would stay. IgE will stay as well. Perfect. So this is it for today. We almost went for two hours. I'm sure nobody's going to watch this video. What I'll do is this. <laughs> I'll try to cut it in two or three parts and say open forum part one, two, and three. Uh, so thank you very much for today. Thank you for hanging out with me for such, such a long time. And I will talk with you tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> Emmett Julian says, Dr. Bean, how do you remember all of this so seemingly effortlessly? You're amazing, you know, thanks. Um, I think this just comes because of the, so somebody was hassling me yesterday about Trump and not Trump and liberals and Democrats and Republicans. And uh, I really believe that when I started these discussions, I very sincerely wanted this that the message should reach as many. It's not that I'm trying to please everyone. I don't think that the patient's communities are now divided in Democrats or, or Republicans, and Democrats have more virus, or Republicans have more virus. Virus is out there. So we are one community at this time. The only community with me is that do you want to listen to me or not? So some people don't like my, my talkings, and they don't listen to me. And some people like to talk with me and listen to my lectures, and that is fine. Some people think I have a very bad accent, and they, they just hate it. And they say, I, I just turn it off as soon as I start listening to you. So eventually, here, are, here, are, here is our group. The reason that I have been uh, presenting so much is, number one, I love medicine. And I have been uh, studying medicine, and I like to go deeper into it. This is just my nature. Secondly, it is a need of the time at this time that we have to know this. Doctors have to know this so they so that they can they can serve you. So really, this behavior that I have is a doctor's behavior more than a Democrat's behavior or a Republican's behavior. This is a third group. It is doctor's group. And this is uh, just my medical responsibility to do this. Luffy keeps a check on me. Absolutely. He's he's walking around right here right now. So guys, thank you very much. And thank you for your tremendous time. And I would see you tomorrow. Have a good night. Bye bye. Please do me a favor. Can you please like subscribe and share that is the favor you can do to me and for many others. And that is if you share it. Bye bye.